Thank you, members. Good afternoon and welcome to the Joint, Scru Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee on Monday, the 11th of January. Just to let you know that the meeting is now being recorded and um, we'll move straight into the first part of the uh, meeting, which is to say if there are any technical issues, we will um, obviously hold the meeting. We'll just uh, uh, adjourn the meeting briefly until connection has been re-established. Hopefully everybody will be able to see and hear everything that um, is happening at the meeting today. First item of business on the agenda is to appoint a, a chairman for the duration of this meeting. Uh, do I have any nominations, please? Yes, um, I'd like to propose Councillor Brian Smedley. Thank you very much, Councillor Scott. Councillor Lilly. I'd like to second that, please. OK, thank you very much. Any other nominations? OK, um, members, as there are no other nominations and unless anybody uh, wishes to to, to um, say to the contrary, I will take the uh, appointment of Councillor Smedley for the duration of the Joint Overview and Scrutiny, Scrutiny Committee to be carried. So I will now hand over to Councillor Smedley to conduct the remainder of the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that, Andrew, and uh, Happy New Year to, to everybody. Andrew, do you intend to go through the members individually to check whether they're, they're sound worthy or, uh, or not? Uh, yes, we will uh, do a do a roll call as well during uh, just just at this this next part of the meeting. Yes. Uh, so the first item then is uh, uh, apologies for absence. And we have apologies today from Councillor Lee Gibson. OK, uh, at which point are you going to do the roll call then, Andrew? Yes, I'm happy to uh, conduct the, the roll call now. Um, so if I could ask uh, each member of the, uh, the committee just to confirm that they can see and hear everything. Um, Councillor Smedley. Yeah, I'm here, I can see you. Councillor Lilly. Hi, yes, I can see and hear everything. Councillor Barber. Councillor Barber, Councillor Cordoner. Oh, yes, I'm here. I can hear and see everything. Thank you very much. Councillor Dyer. Councillor Filmer. Yes, Mr. Mohir, I can see and hear the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Finneran. Yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Pierce. Yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Good afternoon. Yes, confirming I can see and hear everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Bruce. Good afternoon. Um, yes, I can see a bit okay. um, fragile this afternoon, so I hope we will. OK, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, yes, I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bartlett. Hi, yes, I confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Betty. Yes, I confirm I can hear and see everything. Thank you. Thanks to Bradford. Good afternoon, everyone. I can confirm I can hear and see everything. Thanks to Crow. Good afternoon. I can see and hear everything. Thanks to Godwin Pearson. Good afternoon. I can hear and see everything. Thank you. Thanks to Harvey. I can see and hear. Thank you. Thanks to Rodriguez. And Councillor Wong. Yes, I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go back. Councillor Barber, Sue Barber, are you there on the call? No, OK. And finally, Councillor Rodriguez. No, OK. Um, that's the roll call completed. Uh, Chairman, so back to you. Thank you.
OK, so thank, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, I think as normal, if people wish to speak, we're looking for uh, putting your name in the chat box, aren't we? Yep, that's what yes, we're please. doing. So uh, can I, the, there's no urgent business that, that I'm aware of. And in terms of uh, public speaking time, uh, Mrs Lydia Cox from the NFU would like to speak, but on the uh, climate strategy item. So I'm suggesting that uh, we, we take her at that point in the meeting, if that's OK with members and her. I take that as a resounding support for that idea. Thank you. Uh, any declarations of interest people would like to, to make at this point in time? No one has indicated. So that's none. So the first item uh, on, on the agenda today is the leader's high level budget. Um, that's already been to executive and it's at that uh, point now where both scrutiny committees come together to look at it uh, before it goes to, uh, onwards towards uh, budget set. So I believe we have with us today uh, the, the leader of the council, Council McGinty. Uh, are you wishing to, to lead off on this subject? Um, if I if I may, Chairman, yes. Yeah, please do. Yeah, and and equally, I'm suffering from connection problems today, but uh, I will do my best. Um, just to say thank you very much for the, the invitation, uh, as per normal, to come along. Um, you will have seen the report that is before you today, um, and it has been confirmed that the budget set meeting will be in February. The tax set. Um, uh, Clearly, it, it's been an unusual year. Um, we're slightly delayed, uh, but catching up in the preparation of the budget due to the extraneous circumstances in which we find ourselves in. But overall, as you will, I hope, have seen from the, the report before you, uh, as a local authority, we're not in a bad place. So that's not a, uh, a green light uh, to go spending vast amounts of money but we have coped exceedingly resiliently during the last year, and I expect us to do the same next year. Um, you will see from uh, table one, uh, the cost of, of the COVID pandemic that, that uh, over the last uh, year, um, and clearly as we're in national lockdown again, uh, our costs as a local authority will increase. Hopefully the government's grant money will also increase, but that's as yet something to be determined. Um, we've set this budget with a, with a number of unknowns at the moment, or this high level budget with a number of unknowns at the moment, uh, and, and they're, they're detailed in uh, paragraph 6.2. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, my capable assistant, Mrs. Turner, will go through more of the technical detail um, uh, in, in due course. Um, we have a number of local issues that, that um, have uh, uh, come our way. Um, certainly in our settlement figure, um, we have um, had much the same as expected or we're expecting much the same. Um, our COVID funding is slightly uh, more than we would have expected and uh, our new homes bonus money is slightly less. So overall, the, the general picture at the moment is much as it is within this report. We um, will have to make a, a decision sometime this week about whether to join the business rate pool uh, and the likely implications that that will have uh, for us next year. At the moment, we're anticipating no, no great benefit from it, but no great damage to it. Um, I, I think probably that's about all I'd like to say at the moment, except to say that we have over the past few years had a managed use of balances um, with our uh, budget, uh, which has proved highly successful. Um, and I, it would be my hope that we continue to do that in the future. We have allowances within the budget report for a five pounds a year increase in a band D council tax. And, and I'm expecting that to be confirmed as part of the budget. Um, when we bring it forward in February. There are a number of growth bids um, in the uh, budget um, and you will see those in table five, um, some of which have already been included, some of which are proposals at the moment. I'd be happy to hear the Joint Scrutiny Committee's 
uh, thinking on, on those, but my feeling is the this money go is going um, to support organisations that are key to us in helping our communities through the COVID-19 situation um, and that they should be supported. Um, e equally, we have some climate change um, budget requests in there, which I think is equally important for the greening of both Sedgemoor and uh, the general district. Um, and I would hope members would look favourably upon those bids. And we're able to bring those bids forward because of the prudent approach to the budget over recent years. And we're in a position to actually spend a little bit more money putting putting resources into areas in which they're needed. Um, I think without further ado, with your permission, Chairman, I'd like to hand over to Mrs Turner to give you any updated position and any technical details that I've missed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs Turner. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's only a couple of things just to update because the leaders covered um, the things that came out of the um, provisional settlement that came out on the 17th of December. So that was just before we um, just after, sorry, we published this report. So that's why those figures haven't been updated. They will be updated for the, the, the next iteration. Um, just to say, in terms of um, section five of the report, which talks about the um, the impact of COVID and the funding that we've had, um, we're now at the stage on, on table one, we, we detailed the, the, the latest claim at that point, which was COVID return seven. We have um, submitted the eighth return now, and, I, and I'm expecting there probably to be another one to be completed soon. Um, but as part of the provisional settlement, additional funding was also announced for COVID, another um, grant in terms of um, funding, general funding for the impact of COVID, and that was 686,000. So <clears throat> further down in the report, we say about the the funding gap for, for COVID, but that, that additional grant has meant that that's reduced. But what we have said all the way along is that any, any gap that we've got in funding or any um, expenditure that we need to find net expenditure that we would take from specific reserves so that doesn't affect the the ongoing budget um, but at the moment we're looking at there being in terms of a, a funding gap per year with um, the COVID stuff um, 42k rather than the, the figure that we were talking about so it's gone down significantly and as you can imagine that figure is moving all of the time um, so so we're controlling that within our, our specific reserves so it's not having an impact on the medium term funding gap. Um, and the only other thing I was going to mention, I think I think you mentioned mentioned about the business rates pool. We're still looking at um, the final figures on that. So we haven't built any figures in terms of a estimated dividend in next year from a business rates pool because we don't know yet whether we will we will go into the pool. Um, but if we do, then we'll, we'll we look at that when we look at the figures again. And finally, we're still waiting for the final figures for drainage board levies, although we have included some growth um, based on the estimates, the final waste figures, um, final business rates figures. Um, so uh, that none of those should have a significant impact on what we've put forward in this budget, but we are still waiting for those final figures, which is normal at this stage of the budget. Um, and it'll all go to full council on the 22nd of February. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Now, are there any members who would like to ask any questions at this stage? If, if so, please indicate in the in the chat box. And there doesn't appear to be so. Uh, the, the next stage would be to to um, oh, I've no, oh, there is a question coming in from Councillor Filmer. Councillor Filmer. Sorry, Chairman, my, my typing's not not quick enough. Um, all it was was a couple of questions really for, for Mrs Turner, if I could. And is if, if I could give you a, the questions and then do with them at the end, if that's all right. Um, it was just I wondered if you could just take us through that table one on page five, because I don't know about everyone else, but I found it a little bit confusing as to what the what the the two columns, the initial MTPF and the COVID return, how those figures actually marry up. Um, for going forward, it was just on on paragraph ten point four. Um, there are a whole series of of initials for things, and I wonder if you could just clarify what those are, because again, I, I struggled slightly, and I'm sure some other members might too. Could you also look at page eleven? Um, and I was just trying to marry up table two and chart one, 
and they seemed to be slightly offset to each other. I didn't quite understand that the numbers in one column didn't seem to tally with the, the graph. And at the bottom of that page, again, chart two, external funding, um, it didn't seem to, it seemed to be a, a figures list that matched with the funding of the net budget, but the, the heading seemed to be different. So again, if you could just clarify that for me. And the, the, the final question was a more detailed one in terms of community development fund is referred to on, I think it's 20.3 about us taking a regular amount out of it. I think it's 830 odd thousand. Just wondered if you could give us some sort of feel as to how that fund is standing up, bearing in mind the government's cut back on the new homes bonus money going into it. Sorry, there's a bit of a list there, but uh, hopefully you can help, Mrs. Turner. Mrs. Turner, could you deal with those questions, please? Yep, OK. Um, so, right, just start at the, the first question. So table one, table one, the cost of COVID. So the first two columns, uh, when we did the initial medium term financial plan, which I think was the end of September now, that's what we were estimated in terms of the impact on expenditure so additional expenditure and the loss of income at that particular time so that was end of September and and then we had the the funding that we had already had in um, at that particular time and then when we did the Covid return um, seven which I think was probably done we think that's probably end of October early November because we've done one we had to do one sort of mid-December which is Covid return number eight that was the update on the figures um, and at that time, we had we had had um, funding in, so quite a bit more funding in than we thought we would get initially from things like the loss of um, income from sales and fees and charges for things like car park charges, etc. Um, and there have been some other funding that come in that we didn't know about because the government don't or they didn't always let us know about funding. And sometimes it just sort of it's just sort of turned up, which was which was good, but we we couldn't estimate for it because we didn't know we were going to get it. Um, so that's why they're they're moving, um, and, and and again the funding that was announced um, when we had the provisional settlement on 17th of December, the additional COVID funding, we didn't know we were going to get that and how much we were going to get either. So it's it's you know obviously it's beneficial, but it's really hard to plan because we don't necessarily know we're going to get it. So the, that that's moving all the time. Hopefully that's made that clearer. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's the first one. I think the next one was 10.4. <clears throat> Apologies, it's gone down to 10.4. So that was about the acronyms, I think, wasn't it? So, so the first one is about the, um, that's the sort of uh, spending of funding assessment. Um, so that's, so that's what, um, basically that's the financial, financial settlement. Um, and then the, medium term financial projections um, and estimated um, that it's a comprehensive spending review figures. So, does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. They, they were just coming okay. thick and fast at that stage, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no apologies for that. We, we should have we should have detailed them out. Um, the next one's page 11. Page 11. That was about the chart, I think, wasn't it? It, it well, was. If the, the query was, if if you look at, say, for example, the the table for the year twenty two twenty three shows so total expenditure at nineteen odd million. Yeah. That that appears to be in the column twenty one twenty two on the chart. So it's almost as if the two things are offset by a year, and I didn't quite understand why that would be. Right, OK. Um, I'll have to I'll have to check it, but yeah, it does. You're right. It does look like that. Whether we've just done the <coughs> excuse me, the wrong year. The figures are right, but I think we might have the, the years wrong. Is that am I OK to double check that and I'll, I'll get back to you? Thank you. And yes. The question there. The other one was the CDF funding, wasn't it? Twenty point three. Yes. It, it it was just we're 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 suggesting that we keep taking out a regular eight hundred and thirty thousand from the pot, but I think elsewhere in the port we're saying.
the pot's not filling up as quickly as it used to because the government have cut back on the new homes bonus payments? Yeah, I mean, the government have been cutting back on new homes bonus payments for some time. And, and clearly we we don't know what the future of new homes bonus is going to be. So, you know, we did think that we were going to have the local government funding was going to be clearer in terms of what we were going to get and what the new, new system was going to be. But that's clearly that's been delayed because of everything else that's been going on. So it's it's hard for us to um, to. Uh, be confident that we're going to get new homes bonus, continue having new homes bonus sort of into the to longer future. But we've um, we've got quite a good balance in that fund at the moment. I'm just trying to find, see if it doesn't actually say in this report what we've got in the balance, does it? I think we've got that in the medium term financial plan. I, I, I'll check what we've got in the balance, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that we're running with the Community Development Fund, we're running at balances of at least about four million at the moment. So I think when we, we looked at it in terms of the medium term financial plan, if we stopped taking everything else from um, the Community Development Fund and just took the revenue, we had enough revenue in there, we had enough funding in there to, to um, last three to five years at that level even if we didn't have any more income coming in. So it wouldn't be that we, you know, clearly we would have to, to deal with, if, if we were getting no money in at all, we'd have to deal with that sort of in the, the medium term, but not um, in the, the near future, if you like. Thank you. Did you want to come back to anything more of that, Councillor Filmer? Are you happy with the response? No, happy with that. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you. And it's important to note about these, uh, these acronyms. I also wasn't sure why the Czechoslovak Republic was referred to in that when it was, of course, a country that hadn't existed since 1993, but they had good figures at that point. Um, I'd like to go on to uh, Councillor Revens then. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I'm um, just following on about the Community Development Fund. First of all, um, I see that we're using it to fund apprentices and graduate trainees, which I'm all in favour of funding those things. I just wanted to, to, to double check that we're we're happy that that is eligible under the criteria we set for the community development fund i'm aware that this is this is money that i'm i'm not con i'm not wholly convinced as to why those posts develop the community in, in, except in the sense that everything we do helps the community um so just a little bit of clarification of how that meets the criteria please um i this may be a question for duncan rather than yourself Alison, but i noticed that there was a letter which he's uh, shared which uh, was jointly with the other other three district council leaders in Somerset to Mr. Jenrick asking that the monies come directly to us rather than through Somerset County Council. I wonder if we could have a little bit more context as to why why it was felt necessary to send that letter, please. And thirdly, I see in 6.1 we've referenced uh, Brexit as being an issue that affects our budgets. Um, obviously, we've already had has 11 days of the deal so far, so I'm not quite sure what analysis has been done so far of how it might affect. But do we have any initial analysis and what analysis may be done of the impact of Brexit on on this council um, forthcoming and planned? Mr Turner. So just in terms of the Community Development Fund, I'm, I'm just looking to see if I can find the policy um, because we attach the policy, I think, to the medium term financial plan, but it does um, the policy. The policy does cover quite a lot of different areas in terms of spend within the council. So um, we did check the policy to see that it fits before we we, we um, suggested that the funding could come from there. Um, but I would I'd have to double check it for the exact words um, in terms of the policy. Um, but but it does it 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 those those posts would fall within that and it um, we have funded the apprentices and the graduate trainees since the scheme was introduced um, several years ago now um, so it does meet the policy um, I'll leave the, the, the letter um, for Duncan to explain I and mean, just in terms of Brexit there's no detailed analysis that's been done yet and it's it's um, we've highlighted it as, as a risk like we've, we've highlighted several other things in terms of risk that can affect our, our figures um, but it is really difficult to um, articulate at this stage the the um, the actual impact in terms of sort of you know the financial impact. But it's um, 
but it's 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 raised there as an issue and and as and when things come forward um we you know we we will deal with those we have got some funding from government to help with um the impact of brexit but it's it's not significant in terms of the amount so you know if if we do have um an impact we'd have to deal with that with our balances and on the subject of the letter thank you for for raising that um clearly over the last uh, seven months or so funding has been passed through to the county council which they have then had to pass down to the district councils um, and and the reason for the letter was um, it, it's important to get the money out to those people who need it as quickly as possible and um, putting an obstacle in the way uh, of having a second you know a responsibility for, from the county council to pass that money down to the districts seemed an inconvenience that delayed that money getting through to those people who who want who needed it you know and if i could take a case in point with the business grants when the money has been passed to us uh, to to piggyback down to to the to the businesses that that needed it we have managed to be able to do that within 5 to 7 days when it's gone through, when money's gone through the county council, it has taken anything up to three or four weeks for that money to get through to the people who really need it. And at the moment, particularly with this this fourth national lockdown, it, it's even more critical that we get the money down to the people who need it, but most of all, as quickly as possible, because many of the lo local communities are in dire need of that support in order that they can fulfill their obligations. Uh, thank you. I'll make, make just come back, uh, Councillor Smedley. Um, first of all, I thought we were on our third lockdown, but maybe I, I slept through one. Um, and more seriously, is there any specific examples of where the delay in funding being passed down has caused harm? I, I don't think we can measure that. It was just um, it was just a general plea. If the money was going to have to be distributed by the district councils, then really the district councils were the body with which should have the money immediately, rather than you know, the delay that could could be um, provided by by passing it to the county. First of all, that's a terrible way of explaining it. I mean, it's in no reflection of of how the county council operate. It's just a desire. If the money is going via the districts one way or another, it will be better to get it to the districts directly rather than put put a potential fence in the way on 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 its route. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Cathy Pierce. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, first I'd just like to say thank you to officers and everyone involved in navigating our finances through such a challenging year but my question is similar to to councillor evans around brexit the next report we'll be considering is the climate change strategy and within that it's it talks about integrating climate change priorities and targets into all our corporate strategies and uh, and programs and i is the climate emergency on your radar Alison, in terms of planning for the future ethical investments. We've talked about it before at um, at scrutiny level, and I just wondered where we were with it, given that it has been such a challenging time. Thank you. We, we, we did some initial work with um, our Treasury Management Advisors, Arlene Close, and they did a piece of work for us on ethical investments. That was just I think that was just before we went into the first lockdown in March. So we haven't done anything recently um, in terms of looking at that. Um, but it's a piece of work we'll we'll pick up again. Um, now things have sort of calmed down a little bit, I guess, because um, our investments have, have sort of, you know, obviously there's been quite a significant hit on investments anyway uh, across the board. But it, but it's a piece of work that we commissioned just before lockdown. Um, and we'll pick that piece of work back up again. In terms of additional funding for sort of climate change, there is there is a significant growth bid in the report that we're, we're presenting now in terms of climate change for a budget for next year. Um, there's not we haven't put a budget in for the next sort of five years or the medium term because at this stage I think it's difficult to 
to articulate how much needs to go in, but there is a significant bid in for going in for next year for um, specific projects. Okay, are you happy with that, Councillor Pierce? Yeah, uh, Councillor Bradford. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and first, I should like to congratulate Alison and her team on some of the figures she'd done. Uh, what a very difficult, difficult job this is. Um, I wouldn't like the job. And you don't know where you're going to from one Monday to the next at the moment. And I just, on be, I'll take on behalf of the council, thank her very, very much because it is difficult. We've got Brexit going on. There's so much been made of this climate change. Well, as a businessman involved in business, I'd like to just say that to be to be a few years for everybody gets back on their feet after this, and and it might be a lot better time to start some of these things talking about climate change then. So we get back to a bit of neutrality because there's a lot of people on their lower decks at the moment. And believe you me, it's going to take a lot of lot of effort and a lot of a lot of risk for people to come back on board. And we've just had Brexit. No one knows the full effects of that yet. You know, I, I don't we've even touched the surface on that yet. And uh, we start to wait and see. But uh, a big thank you from me, Alison. Anyhow, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh... As David Bowie says, we have only got five years, so let's uh, get on with this. Um, any more questions from anybody? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll uh, move to some of this part of the meeting. All right. No. So, so when, what we need to do is, is move these uh, this report forward to uh, Executive uh, Councillor McGinty. Would you like to come back in? Yeah, I, I'd just like like to to just sum up a little bit, really. I'd just like to say that I think. Uh, it, the budget and, and our financial situation is in no small part due to the officer uh, officers concerned, also to the prudent management of the local authority over recent years um, and, and not having any hiccups along the way, you know, such as nasty, you know, such as Leeds has had recently. Um, hey. um, but um, I, I'd just like to say we are in a reasonably good financial position at the moment. Um, you know, you just need to look around at our, some of our neighbours who are finding the setting of this budget quite, quite difficult. Um, and whilst I don't wish to be complacent, you can never be complacent. Um, we are in a good position and, and we are look set fairly fa fair for the next five years, according to the medium term financial plan. And, and I think all members should take credit for previous decisions in, in getting us to this position where we can weather this storm. That, that's that's it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I'd just like to say at this point that I think I have Chairman's prerogative to mute anybody who tries to disparage oh. the noble name of Giant Killers Leeds. Um, anybody else like to uh, raise any points uh, at the moment? Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll note the report as listed and move it forward to a, a executive. Are people happy with that next step? Yeah. OK, so, so thank you very much. That's uh, that's uh, a, a lot of good work put into that and we'll take it on through the next stage of the council towards the uh, the budget set with the items noted. Um, I have a note here from Andrew Mulhew is saying that Microsoft have reported there is some intermittent issues with Teams across the whole of the UK. I've got a note from Councillor Bruce saying she's locked out of the meeting again. Um, nevertheless, we'll plough on. As I'm sure Mark also said no. Anyway, and um, let's uh, move on to the next item uh, of business, which is the the climate strategy. And uh, we do have a speaker for this one, uh, and that's Mrs. Lydia Cox. I think Mrs. Cox needs to speak before we get into the item. Do we have uh, Lydia Cox present at the moment? Hi, yes, I've just turned on my camera and my microphone, so hopefully you can all see and hear me. <laughs> OK, so welcome to the meeting. We're, the, the floor is yours for the month before we get into the item. So uh, very happy to hear exactly what you say and then um, members may address your points during the course of the discussion. Over to you, Ms. Cox. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for my um, for the platform. Um, agriculture in Sedgemoor is uniquely placed to be part of the solution to climate change um, by both reducing emissions and through carbon sequestration. Our farmers are very proud of their high standards of production and aim to farm in as climate friendly a way as possible. Whilst the debate of removing beef from the cafe has clearly been halted by the closure, I thought it is still important to make sure a balanced view is heard that will also help in other policy areas. 
In the context of meat consumption, our view is that the key consideration must be where the livestock was farmed and the environmental and welfare standards of where it was produced. This is where um, British farmers have a great story to tell. Um, British beef has about half the greenhouse gas emissions of the global average. It's produced to some of the highest welfare standards in the world. And it's really the, the miracle of British cows turning grass into tasty food. And across the UK, 65% of the farmed area is only suited to growing grass. And we can see that um, at home with the Quantox, Mendips, the Levels, and all the beautiful green spaces that we have. The NFU's ambition is for farming to be net zero by 2040, and our farmers are committed to being global leaders in climate friendly food. There are already thousands of examples of farmers working sustainably, managing livestock pastures to absorb carbon, um, producing renewable energy and farming smarter to reduce emissions. At the moment, for example, farmers are producing renewable energy that helps power an average of 10 million UK homes. We know that there is no better time to show leadership in tackling one of the biggest threats to our planet. And with COP26 later this year, we stand ready to work with government to achieve our goals. It is great to have the opportunity to engage with local government in the development of local policies. Um, and the Simonset Climate Emergency Strategy recognises this, and I'm pleased to say goes into some detail about the solutions that we can see um, for our industry. We need to make sure that impact is measured in the context that we are in, with the beautiful landscape around us and all that farmers do for the environment. I have much more detail than three minutes will allow, um, statistics and information available, um, and I'll be more than happy to have any further discussions on this. Um, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> thank you very much for your, your contribution. You're welcome to stay around for the discussion as we, we go into this now, and members may wish to refer to any points that, that you've made or, or uh, come up with any, any questions that, that they have. Um, let's now hand over to um, Anna Mir to present the uh, updates to the strategy before we get into the general discussion. Uh, Anna, I believe you're going to present something to us. Yes, I'll just do a very quick presentation um, to demonstrate where we're currently at with the strategy. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Um, I can. OK, so oh, that's not the beginning of the presentation. Cool. OK, um, so this is just very brief to explain where we're at with the strategy. Um, so we've produced um, a climate emergency strategy, a climate emergency action plan and some supporting evidence, um, which is a search more district council document. So um, hopefully um, everyone will have been able to see these documents um, by now. And the strategy is an overarching document that just explains our carbon neutrality goals, a bit of the science behind uh, why we've declared a climate emergency um, and how we intend to get there. The action plan is a little bit more detail about some actions that we could implement in order to become carbon neutral by 2030. And the supporting evidence is some background information in addition to that, um, just um, a bit more scientific background, that sort of thing. Um, so. The timeline that this has gone through so far, um, so we're currently um, at our, this is the second time we're bringing this to um, scrutiny now. Um, I, I won't go through all of this, um, but yeah, next we're hoping to take this to executive at the end of this month and then full council um, at the end of February, and then it will become a public, publicly accessible document. Um, so there's just a bit of background about the process that we've gone through to get to this stage. Um, and something that um, is in addition to the previous um, scrutiny um, committee meeting is that we now um, have undertaken a consultation with the Somerset Climate Action Network. Oh, apologies, I have uh, used an acronym and I haven't explained it. So um, Somerset Climate Action Network are a um, climate uh, group who um, operate within Somerset um, and they support lots of organisations um, with carbon neutrality activities 
Um, so we um, commissioned them to uh, do a consultation with local residents in Sedgemoor. So they um, conducted some telephone calls and some online surveys speaking to residents, uh, young people, so adult resident, residents and uh, young residents. They also spoke to community groups, um, Sedgemoor um, District Council councillors uh, and other um, parish councillors as well and some um, county councillors um, and a few homes in Sedgemoor tenants as well. Um, and that happened in November to December 2020. And the objective was to understand where Sedgemoor residents uh, were sort of at with the climate emergency, um, what their understanding of carbon neutrality was, uh, what actions um, residents feel are important um, to get to carbon neutrality, what actions residents would like to see us as a council doing, um, and to, to understand how, how residents would like to address um, the climate emergency. Um, so overall, um, it was found that residents are happy with the uh, actions and um, you know, um, points that we've put in our strategy. Um, they agree um, largely with, with what we've put in. Um, they do, uh, what we did find was, uh, well, well, SCAN recommended that um, we have, a, we look at our communication um, because there was, um, they believed a, a, a need for education around the subject. A lot of residents seemed to uh, didn't really understand about carbon neutrality and the actions that residents believe um, are the most important for carbon neutrality um, were not necessarily actually the actions that scientifically would actually bring us close to carbon neutrality. Um, like, for example, there was a big focus on recycling and single use plastics, but um, Somerset Climate Action Network pointed out that these actions uh, are, are not actually um, the, the, have the greatest weight with reducing your carbon footprint. Um, for example, things like um, you know, driving less um, has a greater impact. Um, so that was um, one of the things that was found. Um, residents also um, hope to see the council lead by example. So we have a number of actions about um, encouraging our staff to travel in a more green way and having our own better recycling facilities um, for our as an um, organization um, so leading by example and i've already mentioned about greater communication um, not only is that um, education but also about the projects that we're already doing because then and there was a not there was a feeling that um, the council um, aren't doing so much at the moment but actually we do have a lot of projects going on but there's just not um, enough communication about them um, they also, there was strong support for declaring an ecological emergency. So Sedgemoor District Council has declared a climate emergency um, back in 2019. And um, especially in young Sedgemoor residents, um, there was a push for recognising the ecological emergency. So that's about um, wildlife restoration and habitat protection, local air quality and um, the local natural environment as opposed to carbon emissions. And finally, um, and found um, that there are a number of positive activities that have, have changed due to the pandemic. In this unfortunate situation, there have been some positive behavioural changes that have helped with carbon neutrality. People have been working from home, so driving less, and also shopping locally and, and buying more locally produced food. Um, and, there, and a lot of residents have said that they, they have been engaging in these activities more and would be keen to continue with those. Um, so that's a really, really good opportunity for us. Um, that is a really brief overview just of what the documents are and this um, really important consultation that we did in December. And that is everything that I can speak about. So I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Anna. I, I will go to members now who may have any questions to ask directly of Anna. I've got a notice in the chat box from Councillor Keane. Now, Councillor Keane's not a member of this committee, but as a portfolio holder for this subject, she's welcome to make a statement which in, could include reference to the NFU representative, if that's uh, uh, relevant. I'll just take Councillor Keane first, and then we'll come back to any questions from members. Councillor Keane. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's my, my question really is to um, Mrs Cox. When you, you mentioned the very high standards that our own agricultural food producers have, but uh, and you mentioned you, you dealt well with livestock, but where does the NFU as a corporate body stand when it comes to encouraging and assisting 
our growers to invest in the very latest cutting edge technology to produce uh, fruit and vegetables in the way that uh, it's done in Holland, where I think the figure quoted was they, they are able to produce and export about 70 percent of all the salad items and uh, that we and other parts of Northern Europe have. Um, and it's not cheap, but uh, and also currently, do you know just how much in percentage terms our local um, agricultural industry is producing to feed our population? Um, if we had no access to foreign um, items, would we starve? Uh, Ms. Clark, you're welcome to come back in. Ah, yes, thank you very much, Janet. Um, a really great point that you make on um, sort of horticultural technology, um, and this is an area of development that um, we are really keen to see to see more of because exactly the reason that you say. Uh, I mean, kind of connects with your your next question. Uh, as a UK, we only um, grow 7% of the fruit that we consume as a nation um, and it's around 25% for vegetables and you think well where is it all coming from and most of, mostly that answer is much uh, more water scarce uh, climates than our own um, so the technology though is, is really expensive um, and it's not developed to suit our farmers at the moment um, but we are really working with government and, and lobbying for um, more support um, for on-farm investment to increase our productivity, um, increase our efficiency. Um, and that's certainly one way that we can see ourselves getting to, to net zero. Um, just leading on to your second question in terms of um, how self-sufficient are we? Um, unfortunately, I don't have the statistics um, locally. Um, but nationally, we're sitting at around 64% self-sufficient. But that really depends on um, on the product. For example, in this country, we are 100% um, self-sufficient in lamb, yet we export uh, vast amounts to France and import vast amounts from New Zealand. Um, whereas, as I said previ previously, on the, the fruit and vegetable is much lower amounts. Thank you very much. OK, thank, thank you for that. I'd like to bring in co committee members to ask any questions uh, around the whole subject here it, to, to Anna Mears or, or to Lydia Cox if she's prepared to, to keep part of the uh, the discussion. We, we appreciate this is an ongoing discussion that we need to continue th throughout the whole development of this strategy and I'll bring in Councillor Scott towards the end of this with a proposal as to how we can do that. Could I now go to Councillor Filmer with a question? Thank you, Chairman. It was mainly for, for Anna Mears, if I could. Uh, very positive strategy and, and uh, an action plan. The only thing I wanted to ask about was in terms of the action plan itself. I mean, no actions are isolated in, in their impacts and what we're trying to achieve. And I, it just slightly worried me that in terms of our action plan, we, we put forward actions, but we don't necessarily take into account some of the impacts that those actions may have on, an, on a less positive way. So, so for example, um, in terms of insulation of, of buildings and only only allowing buildings to be built to a certain standard, that may mean that we would have to build potentially fewer affordable houses if, if they all had to go to a higher standard, if we only have a set amount of money. Um, there's a comment within the action plan about transport and wanting that to be more focused on our towns. That might mean that we end up building more of our houses in the towns and less elsewhere. And, and are the towns prepared to have even more houses built in them than they've currently got planned? So I just wonder whether within the action plan, we ought to be building in some of the, the balancing decisions that in effect going to have to be made on this so that not only members are aware, but members of the public are aware that every action has, a, has an impact and, and how we deal with those actions will be a balancing act as to how we take the things forward. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's really important um, within this action plan. Um, we've we've talked a lot about the positives and the co-benefits we highlighted um, of, of all of the actions. But of course, there are going to be some really difficult decisions. Um, and it might be that actually some of these actions are um, you know, optimistic or, or won't be cost effective. And I think as we go, those decisions will have to be made. But this isn't a 
um, you know, this is all going to happen. This is uh, sort of a plan. And I think as we go, we're going to have to, as you say, do a balancing act. That's a really good point. Thank you. Did you want to come back, Councillor Thelmer? Only that I would, would agree. I think that, that as this is going to be a public document, it would be useful if, if that could be to some extent built into it. I know this is a working document which is going to evolve and, and whether we can, can achieve that as to just to because otherwise the danger is we'll raise the public's expectations and think this is all the things we're going to do. And then when we start saying, yes, we're going to do this, but we can't quite do the last little bit of it because it looks like we're rolling back on what we were trying to achieve. Whereas it's just getting that balance and, and a, an understanding from the start that these aren't necessarily all going to be easy decisions. Some of them will be. Some of them are actually going to be pretty tough. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that maybe isn't um, doesn't have enough enough focus in, in the strategy. So yeah, that's a really good point. I'll make that edit. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hilary Bruce, uh, are you with us? Hi, yes, I am. Um, I'll turn my video on for the moment. I'll turn it off again in a minute because otherwise I think it will go. But um, I wanted to ask um, Miss Mears whether the findings from SCAN had actually been fed back into the action plan at all. Did the residents or councillors come back with anything in particular that you thought needed to be incorporated? Um, yeah, so um, unfortunately, the, because the SCAN um, consultation was done very recently, it was in, in December, so we only got back the report in January by, and I'd already sent across this current draft of the action plan. Um, so the plan that you will see um, isn't doesn't have edits made um, off the back of the SCAN consultation. There weren't actually many edits that, that they did suggest. I think it was largely it wasn't so much this needs tweaking this about the action plan and the strategy itself it's more about what can we do as a council to better implement these perhaps or prioritize them when we do actually come to en enacting them um and and about the way that we communicate the strategy and the action plan when it comes to implementing it um there was maybe one point i think um uh, about we've mentioned about water points and um, to decrease um, use of single-use plastic, um, encouraging more water points so can refill their water. And there are a few comments about um, maybe this isn't a, a priority uh, sort of thing. But that's the only specific that I that we really had that was about the action plan itself. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Julie Cordiner. Hello, I just have a question for Lydia to see, are there any kind of negative environmental impacts from beef on the countryside and on the population as a whole? Um, in terms of uh, negative impacts on just the environment or? Yes, about, so when thinking about sustainability, what mm. What are the negative impacts that beef production have? Um, well, in terms of, I think it, if we look at um, sort of Sedgemoor, where it's predominantly grass-based systems, um, I think the benefits really, uh, in terms of the negative, it's hard to pick them up because the the life, the environment that they maintain. Um, the grasslands that we see are essential they um to the diversity that we've had but of course there's some things that farmers can do to improve that um, and every farm is very different and can be taken on its own merits in terms of the the land and the surroundings that it's got and the infrastructure that it's got um but i think that it's um yeah grass-based systems um obviously clearly there is the climate impact and there's um the methane that is emitted but there's also some fantastic um studies and research by a professor in oxford um in terms of um methane production and how long it lasts in our system versus the decreased um livestock head count over the last 20 25 years and actually the net um impact on that to physical global warming is actually a negative in in the temperature. So I think it's and that's where beef gets such a bad, um, bad reputation, because I think it gets compared to um, 
soy fed beef feedlots that we see um, that are directly linked to deforestation. Whereas I think, which is what the point I made in Sedgemoor is we actually have to look at what's on our doorstep and, and how are those animals being produced? How are they being looked after? And what is their impact? Oh, <clears throat> sorry. But is, isn't it true to say that grass fed beef, uh, number one is really for privileged, it's never going to feed whole populations. Um, grass fed beef uses five times more water than other other products and also it, it does lead to habitat destruction of other animals. Um, so I think we have to have a balanced a balanced picture of just you know the true situation. Well I think balance is the word and I think if you're saying that everyone should live purely off beef then I think you know that's certainly not the answer and I think it's all about having a balanced diet um, and I think on balance on a farm you know you can't have um, you know it's very isolated argument whereas the impact of having livestock on a mixed farm and the impact that that has on your soil and your soil health and the organic matter in the soil is essential um, and clearly there are some um, again some fantastic research that shows how much carbon is soil uh, is stored in soils themselves provided they're well managed and and livestock is integral to part of that mm. did you want to come back councillor cordner or happy with that that's fine thank you thank you very much uh, councillor bradford thank you very much mr chairman well what a vast subject this is this climate change you could talk about it for hours and sometimes and sometimes you've got to be in the heart of the things to understand it completely. What is Somerset always been good for? Growing grass. When I was educated some 60 years ago, it was the, the western side of the country was for grass and the eastern side was for growing corn. And it'll always be like that. Now you get some of these farms on the lowlands, what else are they gonna do? What else are they gonna do but produce beef and grow grass? And we see the NFU has come in with a lot of things now and I, I hear what Lydia had to say. The organic system could well take off with a not so intensive system that would help in one respect. And we've got all these supermarkets now asking for quality controlled beef, and which is an awful change. We've just had the single farm payment, which is going to be reduced some 20 percent every year now for the next five years. So what are these guys going to do when their income start to dry up? You can't plow lowland. You can't plow it. You've got to be in the job to know what you're talking about. And I respect everybody's views. They can eat what they like. They can drink what they like. I know exactly what I do, and, and, I, and I respect everybody's views. But but there is this thing coming about beef now, which is, which is getting overdone, in my opinion. You've just had the Brexit job. You don't know what the effect that's going to be. You really, really don't. We just had sex semen come into farming. And what an effect that is having on everybody. We used to have a lot of Frisian second quality cows being reared, no longer being reared. You can, you can, you can choose the sex of an animal now. Imagine what would happen if we, if we could do exactly the same thing. We'd be all, we'd be either all, all ladies or all men. In fact, the way it is now, we'd be all ladies, when we know men at all. And that's going to have one hell of an impact on British farming because the smaller farms and the mixed farms, where this is important to, no longer be able to do this sort of thing. And you'll see a lot more trees grown and flowers, of which the NFU is encouraging for the single farm payment. So as some of the acres go to production, things will change. And I think sometimes changes make themselves. And we don't have to be drastic in what we do. You just you go along quietly because things will happen. Things will happen. And as regarding development, well, I think things might have to change a tiny bit there, but if it changes an awful lot, then development will stop. You may have to reduce a few gardens, maybe solar panels on some of the some of the houses. And let's take a look at transport. That's where most of your solar, most of your carbon is 46% as opposed to agriculture, which is four, 46%. What a lovely period of time it's been the last seven or eight months, no airplanes flying. You've heard your birds singing. You've had your wildlife coming right up to your back door. Just think of things like that. And what are people going to give up to really get all these things they want? 
I think at the end of the day, everybody's got to sacrifice a little bit, but, but don't be farmer bashing because there isn't too many left at the moment. And, and there is a policy out at the moment to buy farmers out. Anybody over 70 year old, I think, can have a golden handshake. And I'm one of them. I can, I can retire and you'll lose all that experience. And that's important in life. And it's going to be more and more important in the next five years. You mark my words. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One really a question is a statement. I, I, I'm in the job and I know what I'm talking about. If you know what I'm saying, right? I, I think we're, we're aware of that, Councillor Bradford. Thank you for that. It, it wasn't, wasn't a question, but we didn't want to veer off the whole question of transhumans. Uh, but um, thank you. Thank the you for that. to come back in on any of that. The NFU was referred to. Did you want to comment on Councillor Bradford's point at all, Ms. Cox? No, that's fine. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, then could I now bring in uh, Councillor Lilly? Thanks, Brian. Um, it's not so much of a question either, unfortunately. I want to say I thought the report, the strategy was uh, was good. There's a lot of content and well done, Anna. But I wanted to sort of support what Councillor Filmer said, really. It's, it needs to be remembered that it is a, a living document. And I think we need to be mindful of sort of... <laughs> Over promising, maybe, and failing to deliver, and setting ourselves up for criticism if we don't fulfil as much as we say we will. And I just think it's to rem remind ourselves that it is something that will change and adapt, and then to be sort of open to the changes. Really, um, we sort of started it, but there are, there is some way to go, isn't there, with all of this? And that's kind of what I wanted to say, really. Okay. Did you want to comment, Anna? No, you're fine with that one. Can I bring in uh, Councillor Godwin Pearson? Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Anna for uh, for, for compiling this report. It is indeed a, a huge and complicated topic. I, I, I had a question actually for um, uh, for, for Lydia Cox about uh, pesticides, um, which you know have been in the news um, recently. Pesticides and, and herbicides, which I'm, I'm sure everyone here is aware, are um, a bit of a disaster in terms of carbon footprint and also in their in their manufacturing distribution and also in terms of um, our biodiversity we're talking about a biodiversity emergency um and, 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 and my question is you know we we've, we've got about half of britain's acreage of organic farming is in the southwest already um you know in terms of leveling up the industry and making ma making britain a center of center of high quality produce What's the NFU's policy on on encouraging organic conversion? Because we we we're still well behind the European average in terms of our um, organic acreage. Hi, thanks um, for that question. Um, in terms of encouraging um, organic conversion, um, I mean we look at organic as a business choice. Um, for our members and it suits some businesses and it, and it doesn't suit other businesses um, but where um, there's a lot of research at the moment um, is through integrated pest management techniques so looking at what else is in our toolbox um, as a farmer to help combat um, and use alongside um, pesticides and herbicides to try and um, you know reduce that that usage um, and that is an ongoing uh, project and there's some farms that are much further along that um, path with organic farmers than than others um, but it's certainly something that um, we're we're looking at and trying to encourage um, some further government support as we look at look at um, the challenges that we're facing but for us you know um, and farmers in the UK at the moment let's take oilseed rape it's almost um, impossible to grow in this country now because um, the seed dressing that was previously used has been banned, um, yet we import um, oilseed rape from the Ukraine who can still use, use that seed dressing. So we're completely exporting our moral conscience um, and making our um, homegrown farming businesses um, unviable in growing oilseed rape. So it's a huge debate, but there's lots um, there's lots of research, as I said, going on to looking at where the future holds, but it's certainly a, um, a minefield out there. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, so are you, are you working with the Soil Association then to promote organic conversion is, is within your membership in Sedgemoor is my question? Uh, not to specifically promote organic conversion. That's that's a business choice. Right. Thank you. 
OK, uh, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I first want just to endorse what Councillor Bradford said, um, mainly in my area round about us um, all the some of the ground you wouldn't be able to grow any crops other than grass on them even in the middle of the summer in a hot summer there's still um, water there lead on the ground um, which you wouldn't be able to grow crops on because you wouldn't be able to get in there um, also in my area we've got a lot of these pop-up um, vending machines for milk and um, some uh, farm shops have just popped up all during this COVID time, which um, many of the locals have been using them instead of going to the supermarkets and that. I was just wondering if um, us and Sedgemore have thought about how we're going to help support these and if we've got anything that we can do to support these. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, that's a really good point about um, support you know, um, what can we do to to encourage the kind of positive behavioural changes that we've seen during um, COVID, um, which is a really big point that we've um, brought out of the consultation. Um, we have um, made reference, so in the action plan there is a section on food and agriculture, um, and we've kind of, it, it's quite um, vague at the moment, um, but we've mentioned about supporting local um, producers um, and and I think that that's maybe something that would come into that. And um, so we haven't specifically mentioned things like vending machines or or how exactly to support um, local producers. Um, but I think that's a really that's something that I wasn't aware of. So that's really good to make note of it. And that's the kind of practice that I think will come up as we go. And again, it's a living and, and breathing document. So as as more developments are made, we'll be able to incorporate more positive um, behavioural changes into it. Do you want to come back on that, Councillor Betty, at all? No, that's fine. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bruce. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I think we could go on all day talking about this subject, to be honest. It's such a wide topic. Um, so much work has gone into that strategy, and I think it was being worked on from way before I became a councillor. Um, I do think it's important that we all want to move on to action rather than talking about it. Um, so we're looking at getting this strategy through now to executive and then full council. I think we all acknowledge that it's a working document, it's a live document and it needs to be adapted as we go. Um, but we do need to move on to action. Um, forgive me, Councillor Scott, I know has some input on this subject. So if I'm Anticipating a little bit on Councillor Scott, I apologise, but um, we've had some extra information. Appendix four to this item um, has the background information, which is more detailed scientific information that I think community scrutiny members need to have a bit more time to scrutinise. Um, and there are things in the action plan that perhaps need tweaking still, but I don't think that should prevent us from moving the strategy and the action plan forward to executive. Uh, the proposal I've got is to put together a working group that can meet in the next couple of weeks, so preceding the executive, to look at the action plan and to give community scrutiny members a chance to, to look at the extra information provided and feed into that working group any input that they want to have. Um, and that working group then would then move forward with the strategy and the action plan as we keep working. Um, I think I would urge people at the moment to sort of move towards recommending this and actually get it through and set a working group up. So as chair and vice chair, Councillor Scott, you're quite happy to be on the working group, yeah? Uh, I'll bring in Councillor Scott at the moment, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you want me to say I something? Think, yeah. <laughs> no, well, what, what, what I was going to say was, was I think that's a, a way forward. I'll come to you now, Councillor Scott. Is what, what is quite important is there's such a lot of work still to be done on this. And as you can see by Anna Mayer's report, it was targeted at community scrutiny at the introductory uh, page. So community scrutiny needs to take uh, ownership of this and the chair and vice chair have suggested that they're keen to do this. And also I hope you'll note that by having the an NFU speaker with us today, the value of that contribution means dialogues need to be ongoing with, the, with other interesting parties that can contribute to this 
this whole debate. So I think this, it's an ongoing piece of work. We need to move forward to catch up the other districts and get it into our, our system as as timetabled. Uh, Councillor Scott did say this at the pre meet I'd like to go to her now, uh, following from Hilary Bruce's proposal. Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, quite rightly, this is a very important document and it needs to be scrutinised slightly more than it has been. Um, and I agree, it does need to be moved forward because we have got a time frame. Um, and I'm quite happy to um, go along with having a working group um, free executive meet because we think that there are actually some items that need to be tweaked in the actual report. So that's something that we're um, going to move on in the next um, couple of weeks and I'm quite happy to do that. Um, we were thinking of possibly opening it to a member of the Liberal Democrats as well to make a share balance because the first working group will just be um, the chair and vice chair and the two officers plus a member from the Liberal Democrats if they wish to join us. We then as I understand it, we will then move on to have um, regular updates on a working party so we can, as I say, use it as a living document and take it forward. And I'd be quite happy to support that. OK, so that's a clear proposal coming out of this meeting. I don't know whether uh, Councillor Revens, leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, wants to comment on that proposal or to indicate a willingness to participate. Uh, I, I could go to him next if he wishes to, to speak on that. Otherwise, I'll take Councillor Filmer's indicating. Councillor Revens first. Yeah, dear, um, I, I, th thank you very kindly for the invitation. I'm sure one of our group would be delighted to take place. Just for clarification, are you looking for a member of the Community Scrutiny um, Committee or can it be any any councillor? Community. I think, yeah. OK, so um, um, you'd be looking for Councillor Harvey or Councillor Wong to, 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 to set forward in that case. I think a nomination from the Liberal Democrat group on that committee is, is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if we can make the nomination, um, I, I, I suspect it would be Councillor Harvey um, would uh, would be would be our nomination. I see he's he's his hand has just gone up. So we either either it's to slap me or to wave and volunteer. I'm not quite sure which. Before I go to Councillor Thunder, can I go to Councillor Harvey in case he had anything other than a slap for Councillor Evans? <laughs> yeah, I'll put put him out of his misery. I'll do it. <laughs> OK, I think that, that's agreed. And Councillor Filmer, did you want to come in? <clears throat> no, to be honest, Chairman, it was a it was a if, if the hand went up, it was by mistake. Sorry. OK, fine. So can I just uh, check whether the committee is happy with that way forward? Um, if anybody's not happy, indicate in the, the chat box, we'll go to a vote. Otherwise, I'll assume from this uh, technological array in front of me that everybody's in support of that way forward. That looks like they are. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, um, uh, Anna and, and, and Lydia, for joining us today on, on that. We'll move on to the... Uh, oh, before we move on, there's a question coming in from someone. Oh, is that uh, Castor Scott? Did you want to yeah. say something? Yes. Um, could I actually ask, actually, we did... Um, went through the actual um, report and um, came, as a group, came up with various items that needed tweaking or whatever in the report. And I wonder if the opposition groups could perhaps do the same, ask their members if there are any important issues that they wish to bring forward so we can consider them. Um, and if they would do it to our respective councillors, that would be, you know, either Hilary Bruce or perhaps um, Councillor Harvey, if um, they could do that before our pre-meeting would be good. So, so that's another way forward that uh, groups submit uh, to, to members of that group. And that also uh, obviously applies to Councillor Finneran, who's not a member of a group, but yes. is equally welcome to do that as well. Yeah. OK, thank you very much for that. That's, that's, that's a clear way forward. Let's move on now to the final item on, on today's uh, agenda. Uh, it's quite a long agenda, and I, I don't believe this needs to have, have a, a massive amount of time spent to it, unless members feel otherwise, but it's particularly to look at the state of play as regards response to the COVID uh, situation, which of course has changed in, um, in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, uh, Mr. Mel Hewish, can you tell us how you'd prefer to uh, take the, this item? People have had reports, but whether there's any officers who wish to make a, an overall presentation to start with? 
Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I, I know that uh, Bob Brown is here, so he has been leading on uh, some of these matters that have uh, gone in through our internal recovery group. Um, obviously, I think things have changed since the original uh, brief was uh, put out there to get this response back. So I think it may be good just to have a, a, an update. You've obviously all received the various updates from each of the service areas. That may be just handy just to have a, a bit of an overview of how things are from Bob, Bob Brown. Thank you. Yeah, happy to take that. Um, uh, Mr. Brown, are you with us? Could you like to give us an overview? Can. I can't see you, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you're there. Yeah, I'm, I'm turned on. Hopefully you can hear me. We can hear you. I can see you now as well. Yeah. Excellent. You're in the same park as after members. I'll just give members a, a brief overview of, of, of where we've got to with um, uh, with the recovery. And actually, it's, we're still in the response phase. So really, um, whilst we're called the internal recovery group, we're the internal re re response group that meets every week on a Tuesday just to pick up these issues uh, uh, for internal um, matters and also report those to gold. So gold um is meeting every week on tuesday and that's got all the assistant directors and all the other key players so we're making sure that we keep on top of this uh, on a regular basis obviously um since the change to the third lockdown uh we've moved matters on considerably so um i'll split things down into what we've done externally in terms of supporting um external organizations making sure that we've got the right resources to help out um, what we're doing internally in terms of uh, managing staff and how we um, keep people safe uh, and then what we're doing for some of our other staff in terms of uh, visiting and outside of the organisation uh, and some um, wider support activity. So I start with the external stuff. Um, obviously, we've maintained our um, COVID response hotline and Sedgwell Digital uh, are prepared to assist in answering those phones and since um, we went into the third lockdown. Um, we've had a lot more activity in terms of responding to people with COVID inquiries. And in the first week, we were back Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. We had um, far, far more queries and we've dealt with those. And we are working actively with the wider cells, countywide, with all the districts participating in how we reach out to the vulnerable people and make those calls in a similar way that we did to the first lockdown to make sure that food and other support uh, is provided to those on the vulnerable list and we still have that vulnerable list and that activity is ongoing to make sure that people are contacted uh, and uh, supported. We're also providing support to businesses through our uh, business grants and that's having a significant impact both on economic development staff uh, and on our finance staff because obviously We've had, I think, three changes uh, in the way uh, in the levels of lockdown that we've had. And with that comes three different changes in the support to businesses and others. So we've been working through that and uh, the finance team, Alison and her team, have been working very hard to make sure that we have the right resources in place and we can react and provide um, the incrementally increasing levels of support the businesses get as we go up through the, uh, the restrictions. So that activity is being done, but it is uh, placing uh, a, a considerable burden on those particular staff um, to make those changes and ensure that businesses are supported uh, well. And we continue, as we've already said, Duncan has, uh, the leader of the council has written to um, the Secretary of State asking for um, funding to become uh, to us directly if that would assist in us being able to distribute it more quickly rather than it being mediated uh, through other services or other councils. So that's the um, work that we're doing uh, in terms of supporting externally. Uh, our staff themselves, obviously, we've restricted further again the access to Bridgewater House. Uh, we have permitted some staff to come in on uh, wellbeing grounds uh, if they were having difficulty working at home or if they had any other um, health and wellbeing grounds to come in. Because of the prevalence of spread of the COVID uh, in the workplace, we've had to restrict uh, access to Bridgewater House to uh, an absolute minimum. Uh, but in order to support staff, um, we've ensured that those staff that need to be nominated as key workers, um, if they need to get uh, childcare support from schools, uh, can do that. And we've also put in place um, a renewed flexible approach to work time so that people who do have children at home and have childcare duties and homeschooling 
could also provide, could also continue to do work and work around some of those duties where possible. We are obviously very conscious uh, that that's placing an additional burden on staff and obviously doing the work and looking after children and doing some uh, home tutoring uh, may be a burden. And we have asked all managers to make sure that they increase their one-to-one -one meetings with staff and make sure that any well-being or excessive work issues are picked up and we manage that as we go forward. But we are trying to be as flexible as we possibly can to allow um, staff to carry on doing their work uh, and to um, and to get that um, balance right. We're also obviously um, needing to carry on doing the work externally in terms of clean surrounds and maintaining cleanliness of the area and other work. Um, that's proved um, a bit more difficult because some of the the rules and the guidance has changed, but I know that Richard has worked hard with his teams to make sure that those that have to work together and work outside do so safely. And we put changed arrangements in place to make sure uh, that that continues to be done uh, as best as we possibly can and meet the new uh, safe working standards. And I think Richard and our health and safety team that, have, that are supporting him are confident that we've um, got that in place. Um, we but just before Christmas, we undertook a full welfare check of all staff. So we undertook a, a specific exercise to make sure that all managers spoke one to ones with all staff to find out whether there were any well-being issues that COVID in the run up to Christmas had, uh, had, uh, had caused and to see if there was any other support, either in terms of equipment or other work support that we needed to provide staff to make sure that they stayed productive over this period. That produced an awful lot of data. We're just working through that now, and the results of that will start to be produced for the meeting, the internal response group on Tuesday, and a report will come through to uh, management team on Thursday, and then we will we, we will cascade that out to members as to what that's shown in terms of that analysis, or what actions we are taking to support staff uh, and by way of equipment or other workplace support. Uh, to make sure that they can continue to deliver their work and, and as I say, um, stay productive. Um, so that was it in, in, a, in a nutshell. There are a number of assistant directors here who can perhaps answer more specific questions, uh, but I'm happy to take uh, any questions uh, that you may have. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. And before we do that, I think I'd like to bring in the Leader of Council for uh, an additional comment, uh, Councillor McGinty. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. I'm, I'm just like to say, I think when members have read the additional uh, uh, written work and reports that came uh, with uh, this item on the agenda, they will appreciate the tremendous amount of extra work that's taken place both internally to the Council and externally initiated by, by Office of the Council. And that's in addition to the normal day to day work and, and anyone who was at the executive meeting a few weeks ago will see that the performance, our performance standards have not dropped. In fact, they've improved through throughout this period as well. So that's in no short, small testament to, to the dedication of officers and members as well. And, and, and that should not go un, unnoticed when many councils have, have seen a significant drop off in, in, in their normal day to day business. But I don't think, again, I'll go back to it and say we should be complacent. This current lockdown is, is more severe and likely to be more severe than we've had in the past. There is a, a general fatigue throughout uh, the local authority and throughout the country. Uh, and we must uh, therefore prioritise the services that we believe are the most essential services to maintain throughout this uh, third lockdown. Uh, apologies. Uh, with Councillor Revent, um, and uh, also be prepared for a slight dropping off of standards of the day to day uh, normal work in order that we can deal with our communities needs and, and our customers needs throughout this phase of, of the pandemic. I think that's it. Thank you, Chairman. OK, thank you. Mr Brown, did you want to come back in? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I did. There, there was one uh, additional item that I forgot to mention. I had a list of items. In terms of our external support, um, obviously testing and vaccine centres are, are really important and the government's made uh, requests, as have others, including the NHS uh, and the county, for support for testing and vaccine if possible. 
we've done an exercise with all our assistant directors and our staff to identify um, a, a cadre of officers who can be um, deployed to that if necessary uh, at a fairly quick level. We're looking to try and get that number up uh, as, as high as we possibly can. The actual call off of people for that has been limited so far, but that's not to say as things develop that we may not be asked to deploy people in larger numbers very quickly. So in doing that exercise, we've also considered what activity we may need to slow down and what services we may need to just step back from slightly if we're going to have to provide staff in to deal with a very urgent request for support to get vaccines and testing out. We're conscious that um, vaccines and testing are an absolute priority. If we're going to get over this issue, then uh, getting those types of services out into the communities and supporting that activity is absolutely critical. So we're making sure that we've orientated ourselves to be able to de deliver that speedily if we can. But I suppose the request for, um, for, from, uh, uh, for, to yourselves is to bear with us in terms of any slight slowdown in service or performance that that may generate. Um, we want to avoid that wherever we possibly can. We're looking to take capacity out of those areas that are not the priority within the, co the COVID context. So um, we'll keep you informed of where they are and what impact that has as and when we get calls on for those uh, that particular capacity to be um, provided out. OK, thank you. I have some questions from members. Uh, Councillor Bruce. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a few questions. If you don't mind, I'll just list them in order. Um, one of them is um, exactly what you're talking about in terms of redeployment of, um, of staff for vaccination centres, etc. Um, I personally don't feel that that's possibly the best use of officers' time. Um, there were a huge amount of members of the public who volunteered um, to help to the NHS when we first had the first lockdown. Um, and I'm fairly certain there should be quite a wide skill set amongst the general public um, who could help to do that work and allow our officers to keep the services running as they should be up to full speed. So is it possible that we can actually look at um, district council trying to recruit members of the public in because district council knows where to send these people? Is there any way that we can get involved in getting mem members of the public involved? So that's the first one. Um, the other one is um, in terms of staff well-being, the survey that you've just completed would have been completed in December. Uh, situations have changed now quite a lot. Um, we've also got a lot of families who are homeschooling, which I presume includes a lot of staff. I've had the experience today, my daughter's been on a college Zoom while I've been trying to do the meeting. The two things don't really go well together. So I imagine those might cause problems, you know, further problems for staff in terms of can they connect? Is their broadband sufficient? So are you going to review that survey based on the new conditions? Um, on the test and trace payments, I have heard some news that there are not enough funds to cover the requests coming in for test and trace payments. I don't know whether that applies in Sedgemoor. It, the, the, what I heard wasn't about Sedgemoor, um, but I wanted to know whether there are enough funds to cover the requests. Um, and also in terms of planning, um, We've been told there's been an increase in enforcement complaints received and there has been um, delays in the processing of planning applications. Um, I wonder whether there's anything that can be done to um, offset that problem, whether it's caused by possibly a lack of resources and personnel um, or is it just um, that you just need to work through the backlog? Um, I think that's all. Thank you. Mr Brown. Thank you. So in terms of volunteers, I think um, we generally agree that um, there, are, there is a good bank of volunteers that have been utilised. It's been coordinated through the county. We've um, nominated a group just in case we need to have a quick deployment. So in other words, if they can't get those volunteers out there we, we've got it and we're asked to, to do a quick response, we know the staff that we have available and how we can manage that should we get it. We'll only be providing those in, I think, where we get a request of that nature and we're working with the other cells, uh, the NHS and the others, in terms of making sure that we utilise the best volunteers that we can for the uh, for both testing and vaccinations. So the call off for our staff hasn't been great at the moment, 
and it may well be that the greater um, organisation that gets applied to the um, general public volunteers, the less of a burden will, that will be on us and we can devote our staff to carrying on doing the essential services. But our priority will be the, making sure that the staff that are, uh, that are providing the essential, certainly COVID-related services, so the benefits, the business rates, um, the economic development people, are uh, essential digital and the other community-based people will be our priority in making sure that we provide those services and we've got that capacity. We don't lose that capacity um, from any request. So that was the first one. Um, the second one was on um, the, uh, the, was it the funds for test and trace? Oh, no, it was the um, second one was the question about staff and the survey. We're conscious that the survey was done just before Christmas and the lockdown has, has come through. So we will be asking all managers to go back around their staff uh, and do that exercise. Um, what we wanted to do was do that after we'd uh, crunched the data and got the key issues and trends that were coming out of the first one so that we can go back, reassure that we pick those issues up and then pick up any new issues. We are conscious already that obviously childcare and looking after children and doing the education is will be critical. I think we dealt with most of the IT issues for our staff on the first round of that, and we've got um, most of those who needed the support to get their IT right have got it. Um, so, but if there are any further issues, we will pick that up and that will be a specific question for staff. So we will make sure that that support is, um, is provided. On the, um, tra the track and trace payments, I'm afraid I don't know what well, our current... Mr. Bram, I have an offer from Alison Turner to answer that question for you yeah. here, if you like. I can go to Alison. Yeah, Alison, could you come in? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the track and trace payment, so there's the statutory scheme, um, which the government have said that they will fund all payments that we need to make, and we're waiting for some more funded to come through from the government on that. We haven't run out quite yet, but we will shortly, and we're waiting for the funding to come through. In terms of the discretionary track and trace scheme, we actually ran out of funding mid-November and the government said they wouldn't give any more funding for that. Um, but we put some of our own funding towards it, we put 20k of our own funding towards it to make sure that we could still fund that scheme. And we've just put an application into the county pot for the con contain outbreak management fund. Um, for a further 50k to, to help with that discretionary scheme so that we've got enough money there to, to fund it. Those schemes were, are supposed to end the 31st of January, but I'm pretty sure they won't consider in the situation we're in now, but we haven't we haven't had any think, official from government yet that they're going to continue, but I'm pretty sure they will. Um, so, so yeah, we have, we did run out, but we did put funding in place because obviously these schemes are really important to support the most vulnerable people. I also have a note from uh, Stuart Howlett to answer the planning question as well. Stuart, are you there? Yes, happy to uh, pick up on the planning question. So there's two really, one about the planning application side of things. I mean, demand has, has remained really high throughout the period for planning, which is great news for recovery. Um, but obviously working remotely, working differently, we've had to adapt the whole process to an electronic process, which was still a, a reasonable amount of paper, paper-led uh, process previous to that. So that's taken a little bit of uh, readjustment. Um, and obviously the working arrangements are slightly different. So there have been a few delays in, in certainly in the registration of planning applications, but as a note I sent round shows the actual overall performance has stayed reasonably high from that point of view. In terms of planning enforcement, well, the tricky, the tricky part of planning enforcement in, in, a, in a situation like this is, one, there seems to be quite a lot of people with time on their hands to do things like break planning rules, uh, and, and two, lots of people with plenty of time on their hands to report them. Um, but what we can't do is get the access to the properties that we would have done previously. I mean, the whole point of planning enforcement is being able to get into places sort of by surprise to 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 find out and, and really investigate cases. But obviously, when you've got to give prior warning of, uh, of appointments or it's even difficult to get out on sites unless it's absolutely essential or high priority, it does mean there has been a bit of a build up of cases. But we, we, we will look to to keep going. We are doing desktop investigations and some site visits where essential. And obviously, if we need to throw some resources at it to, to deal with the backlog, we can. The thing with planning enforcement, it can take some time. 
and it's it and although it is time precious it is sort of four or ten years so there is quite a reasonable amount of time that you can still investigate matters but yeah i think it's a it's a concern we've got in terms of being able to get out and do the proper investigations uh, under the um uh, restrictions that we face uh, Councillor McGint, did you want to add something to this uh, question? Yeah, j just just briefly, Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, I, I would say that we're aware of uh, enforcement issues and enforcement pressures with, with, within the team in, in planning, and, and we're looking at measures as to how we, we can solve that, um, or at least plan to solve it in, in the future. Um, thank you for that. The other thing is to do with monies. Um, I was in a meeting this morning with um, um, the District Council Network and we had Robert Jenrick there and he said he was w well aware that the of the short term nature of the funding that we've been given on the trace uh, monies and was looking at rolling out a longer term funding package to to local authorities with an increased amount of money. We're due to hear, I think, towards the end of this week about what monies will be available. Uh, we have the additional slight problem that our Secretary of State who dealt with a lot of these things has been moved on uh, to another area and we've now got quasi Kotang, I think it is, as the Secretary of State who, who, will, who wants to have an oversight of all the proposals before he agrees them. But hopefully that'll be done later today and the money should start rolling out towards the end of the week. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Bruce, did you want to come back on any of those responses? No, that seems fine. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. I've got four more councillors wish wishing to ask questions. That's Councillor Scott, Filmer, Revens and, and Pierce. Uh, can I take them in that order, please, Councillor Scott? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, some of the, my questions have been answered, but um, a couple of um, things. I've um, had a request. Oh, know about a lady locally who is over 80 and has been called to have a vaccine um, but she's been called to either Bristol or um, Birmingham and I was just wondering whether we've got any vulnerable people aged people within our you know council um, properties that would find that journey too onerous if the same applies um, and whether we actually are in touch with them to find out how we can help them um, and also, um, I know the doctors are actually going forward with the vaccines now because I've had a report from our local doctor, um, which is good that um, they will be calling sort of the older people into their surgeries soon. So I think that case may not happen, but I just wonder if if we have any flags on on that point. Um, the other thing is um, with regard to the business support, I think we must be really um, grateful of all the monies that have been um, given out by the government and the councils. Um, and I just wonder if we, we know how much we've actually given um, to the businesses in Sedgemore, if there's a total um, that we know at the moment, because obviously that's money that is available to go back into our economy. And I guess, you know, once we're over this pandemic, there still will be a nice pot of um, cash available. Um, and the other thing, I'd like to thank all the officers for all the work incredibly in these difficult times. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you. So unless any officer wishes to chip in, I'll go back to Mr. Brown. I noticed that Stuart Howlett has put a, a figure, I assume it relates to that, nothing else, in the, the chat box there. Um, Mr. Howlett, do you want to come in any, to develop this any further or happy me to go to Mr. Brown? I can just quickly say that um, the long list of different schemes that was set out in my paper, it, it counts to just under 30 million in terms of what's been paid out. Mr. Brown, did you want to respond to the other points? Uh, I can do, Chairman. So if I just pick up the, the point in terms of our own housing stock and um, uh, people that we've got uh, who may be vulnerable or elderly, um, Homes in Sedgemore have been doing regular um, calls to the, the vulnerable and our elderly uh, residents. Um, I'm not entirely certain what they've done uh, specifically around vaccines, uh, but I'll take that message away um, from this meeting and uh, have a word with the Chief Executive of Homes in Sedgemore to, say, to see what support we can offer for the, to those who are currently residing in the communities that we provide housing to, who are either vulnerable or elderly, to, to support them uh, getting the vaccine. 
Are you OK with that, Mr Scott? Councillor Scott? Yes, thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Filmer. Thank you, Chairman. It was just really in terms of the report we originally had, it was very much highlighting the, the extra work that's being done. And, and Mr Brown, you've, you've highlighted some of the pressures that have been mounting on the day job, in effect, because of those other roles. I just wonder, as this is going to be an ongoing situation, whether you and the chairman would be able to agree to have a regular update to corporate scrutiny as to how things are moving, where the pressures are actually mounting, and where you were talking about having to prioritise some services over other, whether that could be reported again back to community scrutiny so we know what's uh, what's actually happening. That, that sounds fine to me, Mr Brown. Kim, I think it, it, it may be um, sensible if we can work between perhaps um, ourselves uh, as chairs of the overview scrutiny, uh, myself and uh, some others, to work out some, some key indicators in terms of what you would like to see, and then we can bring those regularly back into overview and scrutiny to show you how we're getting on, perhaps in terms of pressure on key services, most importantly, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, economic development, the revs, and, uh, the revs and BENS teams who are doing that support, uh, and Sesmore Digital and others who are, who are working out in the community and, and providing um, responses there. So perhaps we just work through that and, and I'll arrange a separate meeting to get that together and then we can uh, report on a regular basis. So you've got some um, uh, some certainty that we're, we're picking those issues up and you understand where we are with them. Uh, are you OK with that, Councillor Filmer? Yeah, very happy with that, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Revens. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. Would it be of, of assistance if I helped Councillor Scott with her query about the local vaccinations? You're welcome to have a go. <laughs> Thank you very much. I had constituents touch in contact with me um, today about, the I think, the same letter, um, and it is slightly confusing in its wording. Um, the government has now published its vaccination guidance. At the moment, there are seven centres open nationally. There will be 50 once they're all open, so there will be less journeys than uh, less long journeys than Bristol and Birmingham. Um, you can choose, choose not to go through that system and go to your local GP um, uh, vaccination centre, which um, in, in your case will be the Barrow one, I believe, and in our case would be the North Heatherton one for the, for the Bridgewater area. And there are hubs. There is a hub that opened to, um, today at um, Musgrove Park Hospital as well. So there, there are other alternatives rather than getting people up to Bristol. And we were told on a county council's briefing on Friday that if you can't go to any, if all of those are unsuitable, there will eventually be a mobile testing um, um, vaccination, sorry, mobile vaccination uh, service that will go out as well. So so it does sound like there is a plan. It's just not, not, very, not a very well communicated one at times. Um, my question, uh, Mr. Was to Mr. Brown, perhaps wearing uh, your returning officer hat, um, if I may. I know you were. I'm sure you were devastated by the uh, postponement of the um, Avon and Somerset Police and Crime Commissioner elections um, last last May, um, and I'm very aware that they've been postponed to this this May. Um, that will also coincide with the Somerset County Council elections, except if Mr. Jenrick um, accepts the request of. The county councils to postpone those elections. Um, so we're in a fairly complicated situation um, all round. Do we have any guidance yet on on whether those elections can take what might be taking place and what work has been done so far to ensure that those elections can take place safely? Thank you. So Mr Brown. Chairman, just to uh, pick up that, that point. Um, We've already undertaken um, a review exercise in terms of um, what we can do to make it uh, more um, safely organised. So, uh, and we've got a whole series of equipment and other um, uh, and other things that we're currently on order to support all our um, elections. Uh, and the Electoral Commission recently uh, issued some additional guidance um, to support us. Um, for our purposes, though, we've got a meeting with the uh, area returning officer for the Avon and Somerset elections tomorrow. So uh, I shall be attending that meeting and I should have an update then on, on where we are. The, the noises coming out from Cabinet Office uh, are that there may be a, um, a delay in the, in the air, but um, at the moment the elections are on, the date is fixed and that's all that we have confirmed. Uh, I may know more and there may be a change um, indicated to us tomorrow, but I shall update certainly 
um, the leaders of uh, of the parties tomorrow when I uh, hear anything from um, the area returning officer. Uh, Councillor McGinty wishes to come in on that one, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. It's just uh, following on from my, my meeting or briefing the, the, this morning. Clearly, the government's message going out is that the elections will not be postponed. But behind the scenes, uh, there are discussions taking place to uh, postpone the elections um, from uh, from uh, May. Uh, and the first time being available would be the 17th of June. Um, but it's looking as though they could be postponed from any time from May until October at the moment. Um, but that's the situation. Do you want to come back on that, Councillor Evans? No, that's that, that that's very helpful. I'm sure we will, we will want the process to take place as soon as possible, but we all want it to take place safely. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chair. This probably follows on from Councillor Filmer's um, point, actually, but it was picking up um, something from the customer access report about setting up a domestic abuse report. And I just really uh, want to ask, with, as we're in the third lockdown, um, are, are we sure we, we have, do we have capacity to deal with the issues that are presented to us and also along with homelessness as well at this time? Uh, Mr. Brown, I think we're confident in the, our um, homelessness capacity, and we continue to work hard with uh, making sure that we deal with the homelessness issues that uh, are arising, and we have uh, alternative accommodation. And there is no intention, obviously, to um, divert any resources or capacity away from those key areas. So uh, that's something that we will continue to focus on um, as we go forward. Uh, we are also intending to develop out the domestic um, uh, uh, violence uh, um, issues. Uh, Jerry's on. The, uh, I think Jerry's with us. Um, if there, if, if he's got anything that we further to to add to that, but um, our plans remain the same to to de develop that out as a as a key and growing issue within COVID and certainly with the additional lockdown. So we'll hope to bring back some details of, about how we can um, scale that up to you um, in, in due course. OK, uh, uh, Jerry Milton is present, I believe, if he wants to add anything. Yes, Chairman, my my point uh, around domestic abuse was really that our digital team had, make it, had made it easier for customers to report domestic abuse online if they if they wanted to. Um, so I think we, we all probably know that uh, the instance of domestic abuse have, have risen considerably. Um, since the pandemic so uh, what we wanted to do was to make it easier for people to report that the the actual homeless team have no doubt had uh, enormous pressures in that area and dealing with it uh, it's not my area anymore but um, you know my my role our role was really to make it easier to, for customers to report things like that so that they could access the help they needed a lot quicker uh, and chairman to say that We've been working closely with homes in Sedgwick because obviously there's been a, a, an increase in some of the antisocial behaviour, um, similar to uh, the increase in, in issues that have um, come about um, from, from planning, but also um, with domestic um, violence as well. So uh, homes in Sedgwick, I know, have been working and putting extra resources in to pick those issues up to make sure that they're dealt with. Obviously, there's greater restrictions in the processes that we can follow because of some of the um, uh, removal of uh, access to um, some of the legal frameworks, uh, but they're working, uh, as I say, with additional resource to pick up those issues and make sure that we keep on top of them um, rather than um, not dealing with them at all. OK, thank you. Does that answer your questions, Councillor Pierce? Thank you. I see no further uh, questions in the in the chat box from anybody. Uh, the, there's no resolutions to come out of this section of the meeting. It's just a, a report and the opportunity to answer questions. So thanks to all the officers that have turned up today and all the work that, that they're doing uh, for us. I'm going to bring the meeting uh, to, to an end now. So thank you for that. But just just before you go, I would like to say uh, a couple of things on that. So we've been through a few dark times recently, but uh, we're turning the corner. Uh, you know, and we've had some setbacks, I know, but with the right tactics, the right leadership, I don't see why we can't pull together and work our way through this and maybe soon be back in Europe. Who knows? Cheers.